again, I think this sort of, as we, as we move on here, so we know that this, this arbitrary M0, right now all of the newly approved agents for metastatic CRPC are not approved for M0, and so therefore it's always been that agonizing discussion that you've got this PSA, so we're gonna watch you. Again, as Dan said, we can use some, some oral agents, some antiandrogens that may give us a little bit of a benefit and the patient may feel psychologically better because their PSA drops, but again, has, has no survival benefit. And we ultimately know where they're going to go. And, and again, the, the choice has been clinical trial or observation. So now, Neil, there's been a couple uh, abstracts presented um, tell us, tell us uh, in, in your sort of uh, what you uh, basically took away uh, from a couple of these abstracts, you know, primarily discussing uh, the, the, Spar uh, the Spartan trial in Prosper. So yeah, here we are at ASCO GU, and I think this is um, arguably one of the most significant things to come out of ASCO GU 2018 is the results that were presented yesterday. Uh, by Eric Small, the Spartan trial, and Maha Hussein for the PROSPER trial. And they're very, very similar trials. They looked at this uh, M0 CRPC population, globally performed uh, 1,400 patients in the PROSPER trial, 1,200 patients in the Spartan, both with 2 to 1 randomization, M0 CRPC patients, 2 to 1 in the PROSPER got enzalutamide versus placebo, in the Spartan got apalutamide, uh, another androgen receptor signaling inhibitor um, versus placebo. And condensing the um, uh, presentations, which were excellent, uh, essentially showed that the primary endpoint, which was a newly agreed upon endpoint called metastasis-free survival, which essentially combined the first onset demonstration of a metastasis by traditional CT scan, technetium bone scan, none of the newer modalities, uh, as well as a possibility for death. And I think in the regulatory discussions with uh, FDA that they had accepted this as an approvable endpoint. Other key secondary endpoints included PSA declinations, time to next antineoplastic therapy, as well as uh, looking at subsequent symptomatic skeletal events. Both of these trials really very similarly demonstrated metastasis-free survival in the treatment arm versus the placebo control arms of approximately two years. Um, so a dramatic a change. Dan had mentioned earlier the um, denosumab trial in the M0 space, and we were part of that, and that was about uh, a four-month uh, bone metastasis-free survival, and in an enriched population uh, in that trial uh, of patients with a PSA doubling time of less than six months it was about seven months. Important to recognize in both the Spartan and the Prosper, a very enriched M0 CRPC population to get involved, you had to have a PSA doubling time of less than 10 months. And in both trials, about 75% of the patients had PSA doubling times of about four months. So getting back to that where PSA is really a good marker of biological aggressiveness. So, um, you know, I think these are dramatically important trials that just got released. Phil Kantoff, who did the review, talked about the importance of this asymptomatic patient population, because they're asymptomatic, it's just a rising PSA, they already have some adverse events of the chronic ADT. How do we have the right patient-physician shared decision-making about starting another therapy that delays metastasis-free survival and balancing out the side effects? Right. And I think for the audience, I think it's important to know. So we know that, that enzalutamide is already approved in the uh, pre-chemotherapy, post-chemotherapy CRPC patient with metastatic disease. Apalutamide is not approved in that setting. So Dan, from a medical oncology standpoint, your take, your take on the presentations yesterday uh, regarding Prosper and Spartan. Yeah, you, you know, we're all, as I said, this was a real unmet need. We're anxious to see this, and historically we had that sort of four-month <clears throat> median uh, delay in metastasis-free survival on our minds. 
a two-year uh, effect is, is really a pretty dramatic effect. Um, but there were a couple of caveats associated with that. Um, one is that, you know, the average age on these studies was 74, and the range went up to almost 90. Um, so we're looking at a patient population that's typically older than the, the, the castrate-resistant populations we're used to studying in M1 castrate-resistant disease. In addition, as we talked about, this had a, a rapid PSA doubling time, but um, because they were non-metastatic, these patients all likely had passed through that kind of localized therapy, recurrence, hormonal therapy, and, and had a, probably a longer natural history. And that's, that's why I think we see this kind of median age higher than what we've seen historically in our castrate-resistant M1 population. So I want to make clear, this isn't necessarily the, a natural progression of this population into the, the prevail or Cougar 302 populations that were studied. Those populations were more mixed, more heterogeneous, representing wider metastatic pathways to castration resistance. This is a more homogeneous population. And I think it's one of the reasons why the results were so similar between these two studies is because it's a more well-defined biology that we're dealing with. Nonetheless, I think it's a clinically significant effect. And I say that because this is a population in the control arm we know is destined to develop metastasis in about a year. And we know this anyway. We've seen them. The PSA doubling times of four months. The PSA values, I think the median value was eight. It's almost 10. These are patients we know are at high risk for developing metastasis. And I bet Phil would say, if you did a molecular imaging test at baseline on these patients, probably the majority of them are going to be positive. So again, they're already metastatic. It's just that they're low volume metastatic. What's fascinating to me is that this two-year effect suggests that drugs like enzalutamide and apalutamide work better in that population when you use them just a year early than we would in the other settings of, of M1 castration resistant. So I'm not saying everybody has to get those drugs. But for me, if I have a younger patient than maybe that higher end, that 90-year-old, but maybe on the lower end of 74, that I think is going to live a long time, that, I'm, I, that doesn't necessarily have the comorbidities that these drugs are going to really exacerbate. Because we talk about metabolic syndrome, and we talked about the upfront, the, the consequences of ADT. This is sort of ADT, uh, you know, 2.0. This is a higher level. So if I think there's somebody that can tolerate that, then I'm going to be very motivated to treat them. But on the other hand, if I'm concerned about comorbidities and frailty and other issues, then, then I'm, I'm probably not going to be as proactive with this data in that population. So I don't think this is a mandate to treat everybody in M0 with these drugs, but I think it absolutely should be a therapeutic option for us.